So current status of PSMA PET in the US. Um, I think when we talk about PSMA PET and we talk about all these next generation imaging tools, we really need to talk about what it's replacing. And I'm gonna say the word replacing because I think that's what's gonna happen. So when we talk about the past, it's really conventional imaging and it's bone scans, CTs, MRIs. MRIs are a little different because those typically evaluate the prostate gland. But when it comes to staging the whole body, looking for, for regional mets and distant mets, it's really bone scans and CTs that we've used for decades. But we all realize that they were very limited with regards to performance. So patients had initial diagnosis, you know, if patients had low grade disease, intermediate risk disease, oftentimes these scans were negative, but we knew there probably were mets that existed. Patients with biochemical recurrence, again, these tools weren't very sensitive, uh, but they were the best we had. So then next generation imaging comes along and we've had PET CT technology for a while. We've had choline, other tools out there, but it really just elevates the, the image quality that we're able to see. And when we talk about next generation imaging, we're really focusing on a modality called PET, which stands for positron emission tomography. PET is a, a tool and the radiopharmaceutical you inject, that's really the software. So I like to use the analogy of a smartphone and apps. So the PET machine is the hardware, it's, it's the phone, and what you inject is the software, and that's what allows you to sort of image a specific function in the body. It's also semi-quantitative. So you could use this to draw regions of interest and, and calculate uh, a certain metric. Uh, oftentimes we're all familiar with SUV Max, which we use in a lot of different malignancies. But the funny thing about SUV Max is it basically just takes one pixel and throws away all the other data and reports that one single pixel. So it's easy to reproduce and that's why we've used it. But if you think about it from a more practical level, it's kind of silly that we use this as, as our main quantitative tool in PET. And it's getting better, but we still haven't really moved past this idea of SUV max. SUV mean takes the average of all the pixels that are in a region of interest. Uh, that has some problems as well and it's not really used routinely. And then we have other uh, metrics like the SUV p uh, peak and other things like Persis that have been talked about being used in clinical trials, which has yet to really been fully incorporated into, into trials. But it's a great idea, but not very practical. So prostate cancer has a variety of targets on the cell membrane surface that we could uh, target. And we've seen radio tracers used to target a lot of these. Um, this is the timeline which I think tells an interesting story. So we had sodium fluoride PET-CT, which actually has existed for decades. We saw a resurgence of this probably around 10, 11 years ago, and then it quickly subsided because it only images the bone, and there were a lot of false positives, and I think just, it just didn't work that well. Uh, and the National Oncologic PET Registry no longer reimbursed this, I think, starting a few years ago. 2011 was a landmark day because C11 choline was approved, but it was only approved at the Mayo Clinic. 2016 was a landmark year because flucyclovine, trade name Axiomen, was approved. It was a little better than choline, but the difference was this could be distributed across the country. And that's why a lot of your practices across the US started having access to the, these better imaging tools. December of 2020, gallium 68 PSMA 11 was approved by the FDA. But that approval was specific for UCLA and UCSF. And then in 2021, in May, Polarify, um, which is an FE team based imaging agent, was approved. And now, today, there are over 1,000 sites that are offering PYL in the United States. So access shouldn't be an issue, uh, perhaps in some more remote areas that they might be. So in my opinion, and I think you know, the other speakers in the panel would agree, PSMA is kind of the, the best tool. Flucycline would be next, choline, and then sodium fluoride. And it's great to see this progress over, you know, at least from 2011 and 2021, in a relatively short period of time. So PSMA uh, is a membrane protein which is overexpressed in prostate cancer cells. Uh, and if you develop a radiopharmaceutical that can be specific for that, and it's overexpressed, clearly you're going to get more signal that allows you to image these using PET. So this landmark study that comes from Jeremy and Tom uh, did a head-to-head -head comparison of flacicolibin versus PSMA. And imaging trials by nature are very challenging. People try their best, uh, but they're challenging for a mul multitude of reasons. 
Regardless, it was a head-to-head -head study um, prospective. Overall, the detection rates with PSMA were more than double that than flaciclovine. The one area where flaciclovine, let's just say Axiomin, might have better performance might be the prostate bed. So it does provide some signal that, yeah, you know, these different tools might be better or worse in certain situations, and that's really up to us to figure out how best to incorporate that into our practices and have the data to support those decisions. One point I'd like to emphasize is that there are multiple PSMA agents, uh, two that are FDA approved, multiple others that are in development. There's no real clear data that shows that one PSMA agent is better than the other. So for purposes, you know, where you, when you hear about it, I wouldn't worry too much about this specific one versus that specific one. They're just all kind of the same for the time being. Uh, if you look at PSA levels, this is PYL in the biochemical recurrent setting. At a PSA level of less than 0 0.5, it had a 60% detection rate. So if you bring a patient in my clinic, it gets a bone scan and CT with a PSA level of 0 0.5, I don't even need to open the study. I'll tell you, it's going to be negative. You know, the bone scans, that's my favorite study because I could just read through that really quickly, use a, a macro and move on. But it's different now um, with PSA, PSMA PET imaging. This study comes from Mike Hoffman that did a, a prospective head-to-head -head comparison of PSMA versus conventional imaging. And it should come as no surprise that PSMA PET was much more accurate, had greater treatment impact. And we can make the argument, did that really improve outcomes or not? But that's a different discussion. But it also had fewer uncertain results. So I recycle jokes, so I'll recycle this joke. But you know, people joke that the radiologist's favorite shrub is the hedge. With this tool, you don't need to hedge as much because it's, it's much more simple to interpret and, you, and, and there's much more confidence for the radiologist and also the urologist or radiation oncologist or oncologist. This is a, a table that we put together for a re review article that was just published in Current Oncology Reports, which just shows that there are multiple different PSMA agents being invested in, in across uh, multiple different companies. Uh, I'd like to point out that F18 RH PSMA uh, actually recently presented data at GU ASCO from their spotlight study, which showed a good performance in patients with biochemical recurrence. So I think the, the pipeline is going to continue churning out more and more of these PSMA PET agents. One thing that we all need to be cognizant of is the idea of overdiagnosis. As a radiologist, I want to detect as much as I can because that's my job, and I want to be as right as much as possible. But sometimes overdiagnosis is an issue, and everyone in this room is familiar with that, with prostate cancer. From a radiologist's perspective, we diagnose thyroid nodules and thyroid cancer in so many patients, but we know we are overdiagnosing that. Pulmonary nodules, we see them every day. We diagnose one millimeter pulmonary nodules, and all of a sudden we used to follow them up every three months, every six months, every year, adding radiation costs to the healthcare system. But we learned over time that that was not necessary. So I think there's going to be a similar learning curve with PSMA uh, with regards to what is truly important and what may not be. Initial diagnosis and staging, this comes from uh, Tom Hope and Jeremy and, and the whole group at UCFS and UCLA. With, this led to the approval of uh, PSMA 11, especially in patients who are pre-definitive therapy. So for the sake of time, I'm, I'm going to go a little faster. One thing I'd like to, to point out, though, is there's a spectrum of visible lesions with PET. So it can't see, there's a threshold below which PSMA PET cannot detect disease. I think a lot of times people think it's perfect, but it's not. Uh, histopathology is, is sort of a different ballgame. Biochemical recurrence, this is where we see the most use of PSMA PET currently, and we talked about performance at low PSA levels. This has led to a really big explosion in discussions about oligometastatic disease, and this comes from Rob Ryder and, and gives convinced, multiple studies that show that there is some signal that uh, intervening in oligometastatic disease can lead to an improved clinical outcome. This is therapies. We're not going to talk too much about therapies in this session, but PSMA imaging clearly will likely be used to determine which patients will benefit from that treatment. And what we all recognize is the various stages, the staging of patients with prostate cancer is changing. And it's rapidly changing. This idea of non-metastatic CRPC, you know, people talk about this all the time. Does it really exist or not? Clearly, we're going to see an increase in patients with metastatic hormone-sensitive disease and then eventually metastatic castration disease. And I think it's our goal to try to delay castration resistance, which we talked about in our Radar 5 article in the past. So in summary, 
Prostate cancer will progress in about 30 to 50% of patients after initial treatment. When I see that, it tells me there's a huge opportunity before definitive therapy to make an impact, and I think imaging can help us do that. And in those patients who do recur, and hopefully it'll be less than 30 to 50% in three years, we should be able to manage those patients better as well. So it's a really exciting time that imaging can be a part of. Uh, it's gonna lead to a change in diagnostic approach and management, and that's kind of what we're gonna talk about today. And we need to figure out exactly how to manage this. But it's here to stay. It's gonna change how we manage our patients. Uh, but I don't think, I think it's, it'd be silly for us to ignore such a powerful tool.